Okay, so just so you guys are aware, we are going to record for YouTube, or we're going to stream this just so in case there's anybody who's missing, uh, they can actually see the stuff that we're covering in class. So the first thing that we're going to start off with is uh, the quiz that you guys are currently taking, uh, the financial lit quiz that is in Schoology. So I'll take about five minutes and we'll wrap that up. When you guys are done, if you'd be so kind, just go ahead and put your laptop down so I know that you're finished. Yeah. Uh, this question doesn't even have one. <laughs> this is optimal. Nice. Yeah, there were a few. That's pretty easy. I think if you like take it out of school with me, then it'll give you. But it doesn't even say that it's worth a point. 
Spirit of Oswald is always working with right now, so they are aware that there's been a few issues. Well, in like, it's the one of like. Yeah, so Like the one that says about compounding interest. They might actually be working. Because that like one's for me. When it's like it's in a different, two. when it's in a different window, it has a tool. Oh, does it? Yeah. So if you're just doing it through Schoology, yeah. then it. They said there was a required question, and I didn't realize I missed it, and I submitted it, and still it just let me submit it. So. Yeah, we have some things that we definitely need to work on uh, when it comes around when it comes to the next quiz or that that big 80 percent one yeah the good news is this quiz doesn't count towards a grade so uh we're hopefully ironing out some of the details but um thank you for your participation with that uh, okay so we've got basically three more class periods four semesters over i think so we're here for three weeks. I, I think that's what it is. Isn't it just two? Uh, yeah, maybe it's two. I think it's just this one and the next one. The, well, the week after, though. When, that when, next when it's week. normally finals week, right? No, that's next semester, I thought. Uh, the week after next week, basically? Yeah, because it's the week after next Now we're going to have to go to the calendar. I think like the 21st is <clears throat> you think it is? Or it's like the I thought those were supposed to be finals week. Well, there is no finals. Correct. So whatever was going to be finals is now just regular classes. But you know, the internet's not going to tell it's us. Like when On your um, suggested plays, why is Mr. Crab plays the uh, and then that like, just cuts off? Or like, not your suggested, but like... Those, are, are, my, those are my hot keys. Yeah, your hot keys, yeah. Because uh, I play them whenever students start whining. Is it? Well, you're not whining. <laughs> so, I sh when you guys were talking about the SEP earlier, I should have just broke in with, uh, with Mr. Krabs here. But apparently, my internet's not going to work. So, now the joke is totally ruined. <laughs> Does that mean there's no class today, pretty much? Yeah. No, there's class. Are you sure? Yes. Hey, boo -hoo. Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. So anyway, that's why I have that uh, I have that on there. Uh, that's only really worked on a on a couple of students. I've stopped a few of them from whining like dead in their tracks when when that thing plays. <laughs> so it's it's been helpful. Uh, I wouldn't actually. I wouldn't do it for uh, for your senior paper because that can be kind of stressful. So I tend not. To, I tend to do it when it's just kind of like low key, quit your whining kind of stuff. So it was Nathan Selk actually it was the first one that I did that to because I haven't had it up on my computer. And he came in. He was in my homeroom and he was just complaining. I don't remember what it was, but just whining about something. And I hit that. And it was plugged into the speakers and everything, and just the whole room just died laughing. It was like the best homeroom ever. I don't think you said a word the rest of the time. You're just mad. So um, anyway, what we're going to actually cover, guys, um, we're going to do some more of the Dave Ramsey stuff. So I know that we, it's kind of, we're doing him in, in pieces throughout the semester. Usually what I've done is I've watched the whole video over the course of like two days. Um, but I think it's actually a little bit better because it kind of flows with what we're doing in the class. Now, he's got some baby steps of stuff for people getting out of debt. The point is for you guys not to actually get into debt. So that's why we're watching it, though, because it's got some great strategies to never wind up being in debt in the first place. So that's kind of the important part. Now, do any of you guys remember what was baby step number one? Save $1,000. Yep. So the first thing you should do, thing number one is save $1,000 because you'll have money then for emergencies. So you don't have to get into debt, like credit card debt and stuff like that. Does anybody remember what number two was? Uh, like, pack your smallest debt first. Ooh, very good. There was a name for it. Do you remember what it was? Snowball. <laughs> debt snowball. Yeah, I wrote it on the board. 
So yes, number two is the debt snowball. And I think that was the last thing that we went over where I talked about kind of having those different bills that you pay. Now it's important with the debt snowball is this is all stuff that eventually those payments will go away. You can't do the debt snowball with something like your cell phone bill, something that you're always going to have. You're never going to have a point where you're like, cool, cell phone bills paid off. Don't have to worry about that anymore. But you will reach that point with student loans, credit cards, car bill, home loan. All of those things can one day be down to zero and you'll have no payment. So the debt snowball that he was talking about was kind of attacking that smallest debt that you have. So for the example that I have up at the board, let's say this person's got $1,800 a month in, in bills. Once they pay off that 200, that 200 on the bottom, instead of now paying 1600 on the rest of your bills, you still keep paying $1,800. You were living that way anyway, but keep living that way and instead put that $200 into the $300 bill that you have on there. So you're going to pay off that $300 bill a lot faster because you're paying $500 a month on it instead of 300. Once that one's gone, then you can take that extra 500 you made there and throw it into that bill above it. So this whole time though, you're not living any differently. Nothing changes. You're still paying $1,800 a month in all those different bills. But the difference is, is those bills are going away. And after a while, you're gonna hit the end where all of a sudden you have no more bills, or at least as far as the stuff that you have loans for. That's the place we want to get to. Think about your budget project that you guys did. If you could sit there in front of your spreadsheet and delete home loan, car payment, credit card, and student loans, what does your person's monthly bill look like? It's, it's different, isn't it? Yeah, you don't have a lot of expenses after that. So just deleting like those four things off of your own personal monthly payments makes a huge difference. So what Dave Ramsey is going to talk about today in the third step, you have to assume that you've already done the debt snowball. You're talking about a person that doesn't have credit card debt, car loans, or student loans. The home loan, we'll kind of get to that stuff later. That's kind of the last one, and that takes a long time to get rid of. But that's how you kind of have to assume this person is. So I'm going to go back to Dave for just a little bit here. And... I hit the Discovery Channel, and there were the gazelles. They were out there gazelling around. Now, he's going to give an analogy about gazelles and cheetahs here, but it really has to do with finance because you guys would be the gazelles. You are people, basically. And the cheetah would be banks, credit card companies, you know, people that live off of other people's debt. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm sitting here, you know, saying don't ever have loans, never have a loan, never have a credit card. You can have those things, but just be aware of, of what they want out of you. They want your money. That's it. They don't want to make a better life for you or stuff like that. They want you to pay them and they want you to be in debt to them. Again, you can use that as long as you know how to play the game. You guys already know that if you put something on a credit card, pay it off and you won't have to pay any interest on it at the end of the month. So as long as you know the game, this kind of makes a little bit more sense. And I went, dude, I just read about you. See, get out of debt, deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. And I sat there for just a moment because you know the Discovery Channel is not there if just the gazelles are there. You know somebody else is there. The hunter is there. He's there. He's got a plan. He's the fastest mammal on dry land. And the gazelles have a cheetah detector behind their ear. They go, oh, cheetah, run! Because, baby, they're getting ready to be lunch. Because the cheetah is faster than they are. He can go from zero to 47 miles an hour in four leaps. This is the fastest mammal on dry land. He's looking to eat you. This is how you get out of debt. You deliver yourself like the gazelle from the hand of the hunter. You run like your life depends on it. Go! Because you see what he'll do? He picks out the college student, didn't he? Hey, come here. Hey, hey, you want a free hat? 
Hey, hey, I got a T-shirt over here. Hey, hey, you need to build up your FICO score. Hey, come here, kid. Come here. Be careful of free stuff. No, the way you get out of debt, baby, is you got to run. You got to go, 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 go. You can't let up. This guy's after you. He's going to take you down. You got to run, 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 run. You got to get gazelle intense. The people that get out of debt, that you can wander in. You can't wander out. You got to get, this is a deal, man. It's got to happen. This is how you get out. You deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. You deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. I'm not going to do it for you. You're the one has got to run. You know how long we had to look for a clip where they got away? But I will tell you this. The fun thing about this funny little example up here that you'll never forget the rest of your life. It's one of the most powerful moments in the whole day. Now, I don't know how long you got to run. I don't know how fast you got to run. But you got to run. You cannot let up. You got to bust it. If you want to be somebody in the area of money, you want to get this stuff off of you, you want to shed these chains, it is not a game. you got to bust up into it in an unbelievable, passionate way. you got to have a level of focus, a level of intensity that you may have never had in your life. And when you do, you will win. You will be free. Because I've watched hundreds of thousands of North Americans do this exact thing because of the total money makeover, because of the Dave Ramsey show, because of Financial Peace University. No, because we made them believe they could and they ran. That's what happened. Deliver yourself. That's how this works, but I promise you, it works, baby. If you keep doing it, you get to chase the cheetah. So now, we don't have any payments but a house payment. We're at baby step two. We're 18 to 24 months in. Does that feel pretty good? Say yes. Yeah. Now, our next goal is we're totally, with Gazelle Intensity, going to continue to focus. With focused intensity, we're going to build up that $1,000 account until it reaches a fully funded emergency fund, which is three to six months of expenses. Emer- okay, so he's going to now kind of go through a lot of stuff really fast. So I want to kind of explain it before he's going to say it, but... What he's saying now is now that you've gone through, you've done your debt snowball, you've got some extra money to play with, he wants you to put away about three to six months of expenses. Why does he choose three to six months? Any idea? Average time to find a new job after you get fired. Or Pretty darn good, man. Yes, it's a, it's a decent amount of time that if you lost your job for something unforeseen, like COVID. A lot of people that lost their job because of this. And this is time where you can kind of get back on your feet. Go back to your budget spreadsheet again. And for most of you, I'm guessing that at the very end, when you tallied up all of your expenses, you're probably looking at somewhere between three and four thousand dollars, right? About every month, three to four thousand dollars in bills. So if you take that out over six months, yeah, you're looking at about twenty thousand, twenty-four thousand dollars. So saving up about $24,000 to be able to sit in a savings account or a money market account, he's going to explain that part in just a second. So that's kind of what the game plan is. We're going to get together a lump of money that's kind of there in case something happens. Again, you lose a job, you get injured at work. You know, I, that was my biggest fear for the longest time when I was waiting tables is what happens if I break my ankle or something? I'm going to wait tables. I, said, I, just, I, work, I wait tables, and that just happens on my way. Through. Yep, and I, I fell down once and, and bruised my knee, but I thought that I actually, like, tore my ACL. Yeah. And I, I slipped and fell at work once. It turned out it was a bruised knee. It was only out a couple of days, but I was like, man, what if I had, what if I had like, wrecked my knee? Like, that might be the end of my job. I might have to go find a new job just because of my ability to work there. So... Emergency funds should be easy to access or liquid. Put them in a money market type account with your. Okay. So (laughs) 
You threw out another word there that I felt like I've kind of had to explain to people, and that's the word liquidity. Now, liquidity, when it comes to money, is basically a term of how easy is it for you to get it. If you have $10 in your pocket, is that liquid? Yep. That's about as liquid as it possibly gets. If you have cash in your hand, that is, that is the most liquid thing you could have. Now, the next thing up would probably be a checking account. Can you access your checking account? Most of us probably have it connected to our phone. You can go downstairs to an ATM and get cash. You could just use your debit card wherever you're somewhere. So again, extremely liquid, very, very easy to do. Now, as you move a little further down that spectrum though, when you get to like savings account, okay, there's a couple other steps to get to the money. And if you set it up correctly, maybe you can't get to it without going there. It's not as liquid as your other stuff. It's still pretty easy, but there's some walls there. And that's kind of what he's talking about with this one, is he wants it to be kind of liquid, but also just not like you're walking around with $20,000 in your pocket. The reason that we mention this word liquidity is because as we get further up the investment chain, and that's where we're going to spend a lot of second semester, whenever that starts, um, we're going to be talking about investments. Investments is a bit of a different animal than the stuff we've done so far. It's actually going to be kind of the fun stuff, believe it or not. Uh, the stuff in this class, I think it's kind of boring, is the credit stuff and the savings and things like that. We're actually going to get into the things of like, how do I make money? And we're going to start doing that second semester. The thing is, the higher up you go in that food chain of making money, the harder it is to get your money out. You don't have a lot of liquidity. For instance, I sold some stock about 10 years ago. It took me close to 30 days before I actually got the money. So if you needed like, oh, shoot, my transmission went out. I'm going to sell some stock to do that. Now, that was 10 years ago. So my guess is through E-Trade and stuff like that. It's probably a little bit faster. However, first of all, it's hard to even get the money at that point when it's when it has to be done that quickly. The other thing, too, is a lot of stuff that you're invested in, you're going to have to pay penalties for, for pullout fees. You're also going to have to pay a lot in taxes when you do that. You really don't want to touch your investment money. It's, it's a bad thing. You'll lose money whenever you have to do that. So what you really want is something that's liquid. It's easy to access. So what he's talking about here is go get a you know, money market account. Um, I wish I, I should have looked at it over my prep, but uh, I used to take a picture when I was ever at Union State Bank. If you guys have ever been in there, they have a whole list of uh, interest rates on the wall. And they'll tell you how much you can make from a money market account. And it seriously is like a penny. I don't even know if it's that much. Like a penny every month or something like that is what you would make in, in uh, one of these market, money market accounts. You're not going to make a lot of money. That's not what its purpose is. So I'll let him kind of explain that. With your mutual fund company, check writing privileges. It's not going to earn much interest. And I want you to put three to six months of expenses. Some of you, that'll be 10, 15, even $20,000 just sitting there. Boring, but ready for life to happen. Everybody's bored but her, yeah. It is boring, though. See, here's the deal. Your emergency fund, the problem we get is we get mixed up about it. It is not an investment. Say, not an investment. Your emergency fund is insurance. Say, insurance. Here's the difference. Investments are money that make you money. Insurance costs you money to protect your money that is making you money. Okay, so he said the word money an awful lot right there. But the point that he's trying to make is what we're going to get into in class is, is investments, which is you take a pile of money and you put it somewhere and you walk away from it hoping that when you return at some time in the future, that money that you put in there has grown. Now, how much it's going to grow and how long you have to wait is entirely dependent on whatever you choose. That's going to be a lot of the stuff that we're going to go over because there's a lot of different things that you can invest in. But basically, but the, the, the game is kind of played the same way. The longer that you're away, the more this thing is going to grow. So you really don't want to touch it. And what he's talking about with this three to six months of expenses is putting up like a money barrier around this investment. So in case of emergencies, your car breaks down, 
You don't have to take out of the investment. You can, you know, use the money shield and pay for it there. And, you know, kid needs braces. Take it off the money shield. You don't have to touch the investment. That's kind of the whole point is you have that investment growing and you want to put up that money shield so nothing happens, so no accidents happen. And to be honest with you, it's really, really hard to do for a couple of reasons. If you have that much money sitting there, it's really hard to look at it, especially if you've had nothing kind of go on lately. To be like, oh my God, why is that money just sitting there? It could be making me money. Why is it just sitting there? Well, and that's the hard thing. It's kind of like insurance. Those of you that are paying your own insurance, well, I've never had a car accident. Why am I paying insurance? Right? You don't need insurance until you need insurance. So it's kind of the same thing. That's what that money barrier is. And that's what having that money in savings is. You don't need to invest every single extra dollar that you have because keeping some of that around is going to keep you from having to break into those investments. When I said that I sold stock, I've actually sold stock twice in my life. Um, and it was stock that I had gotten from my grandfather like in the early 80s. So I'd had it for almost over 20 years. Um, and I used it to put a down payment on a house both times. So it wasn't like I broke it out in case of emergency. I was using it exactly what it was intended for, you know, when my grandpa actually bought me that stock. Yeah. Stock, um, are you talking about, if you don't mind? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Yep. Okay. It would have grown, yeah. for sure. If I... Yeah. I, it's I, bank, so it's going to consist well, yeah. I, I sold, um, I think I sold about half of it in 2003. And I sold the other half, I think, in see, 2012. Around 2000, early 2000, stuff just started to go up. Yep. As we see things like... Bitcoin oh, we'll get, we'll get into that. I mean, there's yeah. there's definitely, if I look back, and I'm like, man, I wish I would have held on to that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I cashed out to put a down payment on my house. I mean, 2009 probably didn't help that too much. Well, it, no, it didn't. It didn't help anything. Well, it didn't but also, you know, my, my grandpa's initial investment was like $1,000. Yeah. And I made like 20000 off of yeah. it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's, that's a good one. <laughs> it kind of is, yeah. You buy insurance to protect your house, to protect your health. You buy insurance to replace your life and the money you make if something happens to you called life insurance. Insurance is an expense that protects assets. Your emergency fund is not an asset. It technically is in accounting terms, but you don't need to look at it that way. In other words, if it earns a little interest, that's just good. But it's not there to earn interest. It's there to protect your 401k. Because if you have to dip into your 401k because you didn't have an emergency fund and the government takes half of it in penalties and taxes, that's what's known as stupid. That's what I was telling you about. Because you didn't have an emergency fund. I never had an emergency fund. The thing is, when you have something like stock or 401k, when you cash that in, it's supposed to be like 30 years after you started it. You're still going to have taxes and penalties but they're going to be so small compared to what you're actually getting out of it that you don't care. If you try to cash out a 401k five years after you start it, you're basically going to lose all the money you, you gained. So. Any time in my life when I was a multimillionaire, when I was a millionaire doing, doing the real estate stuff, I wasn't a multimillionaire, I was a millionaire doing the real estate stuff. I didn't have any money saved. Everything went back into the deal, back into the deal. Everything we spent, everything we consumed, no money, no liquidity, no cash. And that's one of the reasons I went down because I had no wiggle room. There was no grease in the gears. And that's what this is. It puts a pad between you and Murphy. You know who Murphy is. If it can go wrong, it will. And let me tell you what, you don't have an emergency fund. Murphy will move in your spare bedroom and bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. And your life will look like a country song. That's what will happen on it. That's how this deal happens. So you don't put it in a CD, a certificate of depression. Because if you cash that out early, they charge you a penalty. That's not liquid. That's not easy to access. So a simple money market account with something like your mutual fund company, and you put three to six months of expenses in there. Money market accounts are easily accessible. Men say things about the emergency fund like it's boring. It's not sophisticated enough. Dave, you want me to take 20000 bucks and let it sit there and make only 3 or 4%. Dave, I could do a lot better with that. I could do a BBD, a bigger, better deal. I got this game plan. I got this shot. I got this. My wife says I'm scheming and scamming when I do that kind of stuff. And guys are always trying to do this. Very, very few women do this stuff. 
See, women, on the other hand, say things like it's the most important key to our financial plan. And here's why. Let me have all the men in the room stand up, please. Let me have all the men stand up, please. Guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but women are different. Guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but right down in here, inside of your lady, there is a security gland. And when she's feeling insecure over the money stuff, she's not feeling good over the money stuff, that gland spasms. And it is attached to her face. Insecurity makes your wife ugly. And mean. Because she gets afraid in a place you don't even have. And she will attack you. And you know that's happened. It happened in my house. That woman about clawed my eyes out. I had no idea. And then I discovered the security gland. Guys, if you want to make one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life, she's wired by God naturally to be smarter than you on this subject. Her nature takes her to the place to be calm and secure in this area. This emergency fund causes her to relax in a place you don't even have. When you do the investment and the work and the budgeting to to, to participate in the process and this emergency fund is put in place, she'll relax and she'll look at you through a different set of eyes. This is one of two things I'm going to tell you today. For those of you that are married or ever want to be married, that will revolutionize your marriage because she will feel completely different at that point. Not because she's weaker, because on money things, a lot of times ladies are actually stronger, but because on this subject, that's how she's wired. And she'll look at you in a different way when that emergency fund's in place. It's an investment in your marriage. Am I right, ladies? I rest my case. An emergency fund turns a crisis into an inconvenience. (laughs) If your transmission goes out and it's $2,700 to fix it and you have $15,000, you go, Dad, gum, transmission went out. That's a pain. Transmission goes out and you are broke. You go, oh, God, the world's coming to an end. Okay, that's a really, really good point that he makes because um, when you have something like a- an account like that, a security account, he is absolutely 1,000% correct on that, that the same thing can happen to two different people and it'd be absolutely life-changing for both of them. If you have $20,000 put away in the bank and the transmission goes out, like he said, like, oh, dang it, that's inconvenient. Shrug your shoulders. If you don't have any money in your checking or your savings account and your car breaks down and you don't have any money to fix it and you need your car to get to work, I mean, that's a crisis. That's stuff that keeps people up at night and people kind of lose their minds about that kind of stuff. Like, that is literally the difference, you know. You could have the exact same person, but if they have money in the bank versus not money in the bank, it's absolutely life-changing how that whole situation goes down. And it's the same exact thing. So, yeah, it's a pain in the butt, you know, if you got to fix this thing, but oh well. But if you have no money, like, that's horrible. It changes your whole life. The drama starts to leave your life when you have this emergency fund stuff in place. It is absolutely powerful. That is baby step three now i'm going to stop him here but just because we kind of stumbled on the second hour too that you know that whole phrase of you know money can't buy you happiness and really after listening to this yeah money can't buy you happiness but it could certainly protect you from unhappiness so i think that's a, a real good way to be able to put that that if you have money saved up if you have that kind of barrier for just bad stuff happening to you then life is going to go a lot easier for you. And it's going to be able, you're going to be able to handle it. Your relationships with people are going to be better um, just because of it. And that's just by just saving money and making sure you have some set aside in case of emergencies. And the thing is too, once you start owning a house or owning a car, it's going to be emergencies all the time. And, and not even in the way of like emergencies anymore. Now it's just, general house maintenance, but I was talking with a buddy of mine over New Year's. His house is probably five years old. He's replacing his dishwasher now for the second time. I have actually gone through, I think, three dishwashers in my life. I feel like I'm an expert at buying dishwashers now. I've gone through three microwaves within like the last three years, I think. So we just had like the worst luck with microwaves. 
if you have savings, that stuff is just kind of, it's a funny story that I tell at New Year's. But I mean, if your dishwasher goes out and you need a thousand dollars to fix it and you don't have a thousand dollars, man, that sucks. And that's the kind of thing that's going to weigh you down as you kind of go on through your life. So that's just kind of the importance of some of the stuff we're going to talk about. When he gets into step four, that's really kind of the, the fun stuff that we're going to get into. Um, before I wrap up for today, um, sorry, I know that kind of freaks people out. I'll put something else on. Uh, before I wrap up for today, last thing is those virtual business lessons. Um, I think I assigned number 10 this morning. Please make sure that you're keeping caught up on those just because when – I have no idea if we're going to have – right now, if we stay in this schedule for the rest of the year, I'll see you guys 20 more times. If we go back to school full-time in February, I'll see you guys 45 more times. Like, it's a big difference. So I don't know which way this is going to go, um, but I would just say keep up on the virtual business stuff because that seems to be the thing that once we get around to May when we start making graduation plans and stuff like that, that we got to start hauling people in because they have to do 20 virtual business lessons because they haven't been doing them all year. And that's kind of agonizing for some people. So make sure you guys stay up on that. I realize that I'm behind on grading a couple of things and it sounds like it's showing is missing. So I'll try to get those things wrapped up this week. Um, obviously this is kind of new for me too. So I'll try to get uh, a little bit better on that. Anyway, I'm done for the day.